Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Digital Access Show. Today I'm joined by Patrick Dillon of Chapter One Employment. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Patrick, I'm really in this episode, we're, well, we're, we're focusing on disability employment and the fact that right now we know employers are looking for employees. And we know there's that statistic that says, what, there's 18, 20% of people in Australia that have a disability. Yep. And I think your co-worker, Rebecca, said it was 37, 38% of people with disability live below the poverty line. Yes, that's correct. Yes, yep. What is the reason that we can give employers to stay on have a listen where we're talking with various people about employing people with disability. What can we give them to say, hey, have a listen, hear what we've got to say? Yeah, so um, look, when we're doing work, I'm a, I'm a placement specialist with Chapter One Employment and I've been working with them for over three years now. Um, yes, and we, we do, uh, you know, probably about 80% we do with disabilities. I mean, disabilities can be something seen by the eye, but also something that, you know, some of these some of these um, employees or these clients that we get, you know, they might have disabilities that aren't so, you know, so commonly seen and mm. don't just in the background. It could be depression or something else. Yeah. So look, so we we get we get um we get these clients on board. They um and employment providers um, give us you know a list of these people and you know and what we do is then we try to then focus solely on them and getting them a job. Now normally with employment providers they sort of help these clients you know with their resumes and sort of with their self esteem and getting a job ready. But we sort of do it the other way where we're sort of like we're engaging with employers and trying to sort of break that barrier from the employer to the employee. So, um, so you know, giving them, we're building a rapport with some organisations, um, firstly, and then sort of saying, okay, look, there's, you know, there's different incentives for hiring these, for hiring people with disabilities, like there may be a government wage subsidy. Um, and most of the time, we just need to sort of give them, get them in the front door. Once we get them in the front door, some, you know, some of these people with disabilities, they, you know, their work ethic is, you know, second to none. Like they just want to work. They want to get a job and they want to work. Um, mm. But, um, you know, it's just getting them. And I think sometimes, you know, nothing taken away from employers, but they, they're just a bit sometimes a bit scared of, you know, are they taking on, what are they, what are they taking on? Is it going to be, you know, they're, they're trying to, I suppose, protect their business and, but would love to sort of be involved in the inclusion sort of side of things. Yeah, so, excellent. So we're sort of just trying to sort of break down those walls if, if, that's, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And, and, you know, most of the time that we do get someone there, like, you know, he's got, oh, they, you know, the, some of these employees are quite happy because they're like, Oh, these guys, you know, they work well and all that stuff, and it's nothing to do with. It's it's just you know some people with disabilities they just want to get out there and and they and they've actually got quite a good like work ethic and drive to work and to get oh. to work and it also helps their lifestyles as well. Yeah, Patrick. Yeah, that you've made some good points. So let's go and run the podcast. Let's see. We we're talking. We've talked to Mark Musket about the interview process and the extra challenges that people have. We've talked to you actually about the technology that you use and how ch technology makes things very um, accessible and doable. We've talked to Rebecca uh, Djokovic, who's your uh, co-colleague, about how you guys work with uh, employers. We've talked to Brendan Somerville from Spinal Life, again, about how he works with employers. And then finally, we're talking to Paula Burgess from Beyond the White Maze, who is a business owner herself, and the adjustments that she makes and how those adjustments have actually helped the whole business become a much better business. So let's go and run the podcast. We're 
with yeah, with, <laughs> with employers, do employers see your vision or your lack of vision as a well, how can he do the job? You've got to prove to me and like anyone going into an interview has to prove that yeah they can do the job but you would have had that extra challenge where you had to be able to say yeah i think um, yeah i think um i mean i i think with um employers it's an interesting one because you've got to not only prove yourself to be able to do the job mm based on their selection criteria, but you've also got to be able to prove that that you can overcome your, your barriers that your blindness springs with that. Yeah. To to actually um, achieve that um or achieve those tasks that are actually out um, that are part of that position description. So it's it's a really hard um um uh thing to actually balance when you're actually in a job interview because you're not only trying to convey the information that you can do the job based on what your experience and, and um, your skills, but you also got to be mindful that you need to explain to them how you're actually able to do that position yeah. um, as a blind person. Um, yeah, where I think um, when I was working at Coles Mine, we weren't very sure how I was going to do the stuff because they were still using the old IBM um, 3270s. Um, oh, gosh. Okay, um, yep. And they'll, they'll go back to your day, uh, Muriel, I'm sure. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we, we were you know, we were interested to see whether back then um, what terminal programs would work with the screen reader, which was JAWS, Four, I think four point five one or something like, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um. So, um. Yeah. We we had to do a little bit of um experimenting, playing around. Um. Uh, there was a bit of jaw scripting there for a little while. Um. So there was there was a whole lot of factors that actually yeah um were you know achieve to actually allow me to do that job yeah. um, so what what are the aspects of leadership that you think are the most important empathy is is huge empathy yes. is very very important having an understanding of what other people are going through mm -hmm. um, being in that space of uplifting and empowering the people around you rather than directing them in a way that makes them feel controlled or coerced. If you uplift and empower and have those people feeling like they have some autonomy in their own right and they have ownership of what it is that they're doing and working on, it makes all the difference to the outcomes that you have as a leader. It's so very important. Being aware to their needs and not assuming what their needs might be simply because you have an idea in your mind about what something might be. You know, we can never assume around what people need. We have to ask that question and be prepared to really listen. Yeah. <laughs> so communicating very well is extremely important in your ability to lead and your ability to be that person who runs, whether it is a your own business or someone else's business, whether it's in a corporation or in that space of entrepreneurship, doesn't matter. We are all in that business of leadership as we make our way through that journey. Yeah. And even as a parent, even as an everyday citizen, yeah. there are leadership moments. Every person is a leader. They may not realise it, but every person is a leader in some aspect in their life. And all of these sorts of behaviours are absolutely pivotal to having good leadership. Like just the technology, I mean, I've seen how much it's um, involved. You know, I got over just a period of the, like my injury has been, you know, unbelievable. Just um, just in the technology of the chairs, and mm. um, but um, yeah, I I don't know, I've just. 
I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a keen, well, I'm an editor, but I'm pretty keen to always learn about different technology and how big we use it. And also, I suppose, to give me kids and people why, if, what my technology is and the sort of automation I have, Alan. Yeah, so going, Patrick, going from having to relearn all that technology, learning to use it in a completely different way to the way you were using it, to being you know, as independent as you are, you you work full time again. You're um, you're on a various committee around the joint, advocating and different things for people with disability. What type of technologies do you use every day to keep yourself independent? And I believe you've got a child, so you know you've got homework to do there as well. Yeah, it's yes. Um, with the child sort of things, I'm just basically I've got um, I've got my chair, so I'm basically just a, a wheeling playground for her. Um, <laughs> with a, a wheeling climbing frame, so it's just yeah. So that's yeah. But on the technology, um, we adapted my wheelchair for her. There, like um, you know, we've got seats that sit on the front of it, so she can sit there. Yeah, um, get towing points and stuff like that. Um, with the work side of things, like. I for I've I've got like a three screen computer thing at home, um, yeah. and I just don't only use the three screens. I'll use them a lot, and it's not just because um, of I, I mean I probably would use it before when I, if I wouldn't have had this disability, but with the disability as well, I'm doing my mouse. I do my mouse with my chin. Okay. So how that works basically is my wheelchair is a my wheelchair is a chin control wheelchair yeah. so i move my wheelchair with my chin but when i pull up to kenny to buy stuff computer i can then turn my chair into a bluetooth and my chin controller becomes a mouse okay so yeah so if i'm like i'm out from out and about i can just press a button on my wheelchair it goes to bluetooth i can pick what device it is if it's my phone i just press that and then i can use my chin control on my phone, and as a little mouse pointer, yeah, and then they do a click and drag and a click thing too, and stuff. And it's the same as a computer. Is it innovation unbelievably brilliant? I mean, what yeah, what, yeah, what it allows us to do. So, you think of disability employment. I know a lot of people would think of like Help Industries, the Endeavour Group. What are you really focusing on with disability employment? Are you looking at that sector or what are you actually looking at? Um, so we we look at getting um, people with disability in, employed into the open market. So that's our key focus, not, not the supported employment opportunities. Um, I have a firm belief that we shouldn't be retiring anybody for life. Uh, I think that was a term that a colleague of mine that you had on the show um, uh, mentioned once before that after his injury and recovery, he was told by the system around us, which was, um, you know, he was given a DSP and he was basically told, don't worry, so you don't have to work. Um, uh, just put that to the side and go and enjoy your life. And it was such a, uh, for him and even my my family member who, who went through her own journey with her brain trauma injury, um, you know, it's such a, a numbing and, fearful thing that they face at that point because there are people uh, most of us get a lot from our careers I know that um, you know it's part of who I am the job that I do and I like to know that I'm contributing to my family financially to my community um, and to have that taken away without that being something you get a choice in um, I know that my colleague cha championed that and he now works at Chapter 1 as well. Um, and I just think that nobody should be retired for life. And I don't believe that we should ever be saying to someone how much or how little they can contribute. It should be about the person. It should be a person-centred service. And it should be about that individual guiding what that service looks like for them. So um, really proud to work with an organisation where we get to really empower that in the individual. And we then work um, directly with disability employment services providers and NDIS providers to support their clients in that journey. Um, our core focus um, is really around educating employers as well because you can't help people with disability without getting employers to be allies in that process and actually be really positive and proactive in, in wanting to create a more inclusive workplace. 
with employers, how do you find the employers? I mean, if you take someone like myself, yes, I've got a severe vision impairment. I do have, have a lot of skills. And I know for me, they considered that I couldn't work once nearly all my sight was gone. And the employer I was work, working with at the time really struggled to change the system so that I could continue working. How do you deal with that with employers? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's probably um, it's probably one of the hardest things we do. And I think the first thing we have to do is realise that we're a people-to-people business um, in the sense that uh, no two employers will have the same response when, when we go out there to promote our service and, and promote inclusivity. Um, mm-hmm. Some employers will have a very um, honest fear of risk or of the person's safety or perhaps other workers' safety on safety in the workplace. Uh, some employers just uh, lack understanding about what that means. And I think many employers, um, I think, and even people um, that we talk to, uh, if you talk, you say the word disability, many of them think about, um, you know, the most serious uh, physical disabilities. You know, yeah. they'll immediately have a picture of someone who is wheelchair, um, you know, living like in a wheelchair or someone who is uh, on crutches or someone who, you know, you know, very significant disabilities. Um, very few employers immediately think, well, 50% of the people that are, that are engaging these services to come back to work actually have a mental health disability or condition. Um, you know, uh, and so they are immediately sort of not aware of a very large talent pool of people that can def- definitely contribute to their workplace um, because there's that, that immediate image. Um, we, how we go about our job is relationship building. A lot of the time it starts with a phone call or a networking event, which I think is how we met. Um, yeah. And it, it's just it's just pushes our people to be champions for that change all the time and to really come out on the forefront and talk about with pride that we uh, work with people with disability Um, and we don't shy away from that conversation sometimes people go a bit quiet you hear crickets in the background but it's really important to us that we advocate Um, all too often we leave it to the people with disability to advocate for themselves Um, and I think that'd be a very lonely place so um how we engage employers is we're very much on the front foot. We go out there and actively start conversations about that. And we then try to learn what their fears or mindsets are and how we can support change. Um, So it's usually a very slow process, but it's um, a worthwhile process because when we get those employers and we get those placements, it's um, it's a really great feeling for all, um, everyone involved. What type of changes? So what are the differences that you encourage employers to do to take on a person with a disability? Well, so the first thing is um, is that I talk to them about, you know, you know the, what the research said about employing people with disability. So there is evidence out there that says that employing people with disability is, makes a, sorry, is a great economic um, decision for a business. Because mm-hmm. they have, uh, they're more loyal workforce. They um, are retained for longer. They have, on average, less sick days. Uh, these people are more generally innovative and pro- uh, great at problem solving because they have mm-hmm. to do that as part of their everyday lives um, to yep. navigate obstacles in their community. Yep. Um, and yeah, um, so so that's that's the first um, thing that I you know go to them about. And then we start talking about you know the. Um, structural stuff of their business so you know what policies and procedures do you have in place um, yeah. if any? Um, you know what practices do you have in place in terms of inclusive recruitment um, yeah. and onboarding um, skills yeah. um, you know what what um, programs do you have in place once you've onboarded um, the person with disability to help them remain engaged and be able to um, connect with the supports that they may need if they are um, requesting reasonable adjustments yeah. Um, you know, uh, and you know, they're not always going to be requesting reasonable adjustments, but um, in some cases they may, and uh, in most cases, uh, those reasonable adjustments are very um, cost effective, and uh, you may also be able to claim um, reimbursement uh, for those um, reasonable adjustments through job access as well. The ADHD brain just processes so quickly that if you're giving them all this information at once, it just can't 
you know, just can't focus on all of that information. So giving them one step at a time and and I had to really find that I did that very differently. Um, you know, because you'd say to a child in the morning, like, well, we're going to pass that now, but going back, you'd say to a child, all right, go get the uniform on, go get your shoes on, go brush your teeth, and brush your hair, and let's get out the door. And for ADHD kids, that's like, whoa, that's just, what are you talking about? It all blends in together and they do nothing because it just goes into overwhelm. So I literally had to stop myself and say, all right, you need to go put your uniform on. When that was done, now you need to go put your shoes on. Now you need to go brush your teeth. So really stage it out. So then it gives that, it slows that kind of processing down to be able to understand the steps and what to do. So how have you taken that approach and applied it to your team and in your everyday work? I think I'd use it every day as a natural now because it's just something that, um, you know, I've got used to. I guess I had to retrain myself because I reckon maybe I'm a little bit ADHD. I haven't been tested, but could be. Um, so I've kind of just rushed into doing things as well. But if I take it back and step it back, even down to goal setting for the business, um, you know, I know my end goal and then we work it back with both and the team set goals as well. So we know the end goal and then we work it back over the business in what we're going to do week by week to get to that end goal. And again, that sounds quite simple, but we're all thinking ahead and we're all racing regardless of you know whether we're near a diversion or not. We've all got 10 million things going on in our head, especially if we're mums. Um, you know, and so to be able to break it down and go, right, this is what I'm doing this week, this is what I'm doing next week. And the team work like that as well. And then, of course, within that, we have tasks that I have to do each week and things like that that they're checking off your checklists and stuff like that. Wow, Patrick, that was one informative podcast. Thanks again. I don't know whether you knew you were going to be dumped in like I've done. (laughs) I appreciated your time, Patrick, because I don't think people realise just how much technology has changed the world for people with disability. Yes, most definitely, yeah. and it's also yeah, definitely made inclusion a lot easier. So, yeah, definitely um, good time to have technology. Yeah, and I think it's also made life much easier for employers because there's so much they can do with very little cost or no extra cost to bring in people with disability, get great employees that really want to work. Let's face it, you and I are good examples of that because we both love working. We could choose to sit on the pension. We don't. We want to work. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So, Patrick, how can anyone, if they want to find out more about employing people with disability, how can they contact you? Um, they could contact our organisation, Chapter One Employment. Um, yeah, definitely. They can also, you know, I've, um, I'm happy for you to give my details and my phone number and email address or Rebecca's. Um, and Rebecca's, you know, she does a lot of the placement and also training specialists. So, you know, she organises different types of training and programs. Um, so, you know, she's very, you know, well adapted in that area. So organisations that, you know, maybe want to do some training or, you know, you know employers that want to do some training to get you know, people with disabilities in. Yeah. So, yeah, but um, look, happy to, they're happy to have a chat. As I'm pretty sure one of our placement specialists would be, there to have a chat and um, yeah, we can go from there. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. And I think our final message, I think from both of us, don't be afraid of employing a person with disability. Look yes. at the opportunities it brings you. Paula Burgess made the best point, didn't she, when she pointed out that the changes that she made to employ a person with disability has benefited the whole of the company that she runs because it's made the company more efficient. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. So that's today's episode of the Digital Access Show. Again, thank you very much, Patrick Dillon, for jumping in and helping me with this. I was a bit lost for words. Please. (laughs) Thank you very much. Like, subscribe, review, share. We'd love a Google review or any review. Tell us what you think. And we'll see you next time on the Digital Access Show.